views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to today's verdict, the live and interactive show that brings you your legal rights and options. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. As you can see, we are once again coming to you from my home. This is our second coronavirus show. And it is an important one. We have three guests joining us today. Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz is with us to discuss all he is doing to help his constituents through this difficult time. Next up, Lorelai Salas, the commissioner of the New York City Department of Health, will be here to let our viewers know all her department is doing to fight against price gouging, which unfortunately has been going on throughout our city. And finally, uh, Joshua Goldstein is here. Joshua is an estate attorney will help let you know what directives you should have for your loved ones in case you do end up becoming ill. As you can see, we have much to get to, so stay tuned. Today's verdict starts right now. have uh, Jeffrey Dinowitz, the assemblyman from District 81 and a good friend of the show. Uh, first of all, uh, Jeffrey, how are you feeling? So far, so good. All right. Doing our social distancing, right? I sure am. Stay away. Stay away. I get it. So um, uh, tell me a little bit about what you've been doing uh, for the constituents. I'm sure you have been extremely busy. Um, let's give a little bit of an update. Well, this week in particular is crazy because in addition to our constituent work, we have Albany work, and I'm, I'm going to be driving back to Albany shortly, even though I think it's crazy that we're going to be in Albany in the first place, but we have this thing called the state budget that's due, and actually it's been due since midnight. But in the district, we are operating very differently than we have in the past because our office is closed, but... My staff is working at least as hard, if not harder, than they normally do. Uh, they're working from home on their computer. We are checking our emails constantly. We're checking the answering machine. So if people leave messages, we return them almost immediately. The only thing we're not doing is in-person stuff like, like free notary service, which, of course, we do the rest of the time. And uh, in addition, my staff and I have meetings at least once, if not more, times a day like this. Uh, we, we meet through Zoom so we can all see each other, compare notes. All of our cases are on a, uh, I guess, a Google document so I could see everything that uh, that they're doing, uh, who calls in or who emails us, what their problem is, have we resolved it, and, and how we're dealing with it. A very large number of the cases these past few days deal with people who have been having trouble getting through to unemployment because you know, there were so many people calling that uh, you know the computers, the phones, everything is is uh, back you know is is just backlog, and we've been getting a lot of calls these past several days because the one hundred four six three post office has either stopped or hardly delivers mail at the moment, and there are very legitimate reasons for it, but nonetheless very upsetting to people, and we the post office needs to come up with a plan, but beyond that, we're dealing with stuff we normally deal with. Um, in, in a way, we normally deal with it, uh, with the exception of being there in person. So just, just as an example, we had an issue a few days ago with, uh, you know, kids have to be at home now for their schooling, and they have to have access to the Internet. But uh, one of the companies, I guess it's Altice, um, if, if the family was back on their, you know, behind on their bill, the kids didn't have Internet service, and we helped convince them to make sure that the kids can have their internet service so that they can do the um, remote learning that they're doing in school right now. That's really, really important uh, to a lot of people. You know, the kids should not uh, suffer not getting an education simply because their family couldn't afford to pay last month's cable bill or last month's, I guess, internet bill. Um, so that's one example. We had a situation where one of the local supermarkets, uh, we had heard that they might be about to close and so we were involved with trying to forestall that situation. 
And those are just a, a couple of examples. Yeah. But uh, people are very, they're very scared. Uh, and, and the most important thing we tell people is don't go out. And uh, you, even if you have to get food, a lot of places deliver. Which leads me to, you know, I, I love what you did with the suspension of the alternate side parking. I thought that was really such a smart move. The last thing you want is the people to go outside to have to keep moving their car. You know, right. that certainly takes away from the social distancing, I think. Actually, that was because of, of neighbors of ours who were uh, confined. They were they had to be isolated for two weeks and they called us. They called me at home, actually. Um, and said, what do we do about our car? You know, we're not going to go out. We're not supposed to go out. We don't want to endanger anybody else. And so my, myself and Councilman Cohen both uh, contacted the city to try to uh, convince them to suspend all the side. At first, what they were willing to do is tell people, okay, give us a note. You know, give, give the, if you get a ticket and we'll get, make sure it gets dismissed, that type of thing. And we said, okay, that's nice, but not really good enough. Um, so ultimately, we pressured them and other elected officials, I think, around the city cared about this, too, uh, into suspending alternate side. And they've done that two weeks at a time. So right now, I believe it's suspended through April. I don't, I don't remember the date, but I think the, the, the 14th, somewhere around there. And I think it's going to remain that way through the duration of, of this crisis. Tell me, what is going on? Speaking of automobiles, the DMV, well, well, I understand that some automobile, the inspections are almost up at the beginning of the month. They don't want to extend the time to be able to have a valid inspection. Well, they, What's they, going on? Well, they didn't want to. And, um, uh, I spoke out on that and the governor has now issued an executive order relating to the inspection. So basically Good. people have to brief for a month. Um, and uh, the same thing is true with renewal of driver's licenses. Uh, it, it, it would be sheer lunacy to tell people to stay home, but then tell people, but you got to go out and get your car inspected. Um, in the case of my neighbor, for example, um, the ticket was dismissed. But here on in, there, there won't be alternate side as of the date that that started. So people won't be getting the tickets. But people should be careful because the uh, some of the people who issue those tickets, they'll probably try to find some other reason to give you a ticket. So just be very careful. Uh, so we have the uh, the commissioner of the Department of Health is going to be on. Um, tell me, have you have you heard anything about price gouging in your neighborhoods? Uh, anything about um, you know masks, um, uh, any, toilet paper, medicines? Have you heard of this going on? Uh, we had a complaint a week or so ago that one of the local pharmacies, uh, the price of Purell was twice as high as it normally would be. But for the most part, we haven't. Heard. I mean, the biggest complaint, of course, that people have is that there are certain things they can't get right now. Uh, toilet paper, for example, you can't get it. Uh, yeah. So for, for those who um, in the past have accused me of being a hoarder, well, looks like I was the smart one as far as things like That's that. Right. Um, the truth is, seriously, it, it, people should be very... Uh, yeah. aware that some things may remain in short supply and they should just conserve to the greatest extent that they can. you have any uh, final tips? You have about, about 45 seconds left. That somebody watching, um, you want to give them some advice as to what they should or should not be doing um, until this whole pandemic comes to an end? Listen, I'm not the health expert, but I, I know what we see repeatedly on TV. Stay away from other people. Don't, you know, stay at least six feet away, stay home to the greatest extent possible. There's very few reasons you really have to go out and constantly wash your hands and uh, be very, very careful about what you do. And if there are issues you think our office can help you with, please don't be shy. Call the phone number uh, or email us. Those are the ways you can reach us. And, and our my staff is great at getting back to people pretty quickly. Well, Assemblyman uh, Denowitz, a friend of the show, thank you so much for being here during these tying times, times and uh, most importantly, please stay safe. Thank you. Same to you. All right. We'll be back with more Today's Verdict right after this.
We're here with Lorelei Salas, the commissioner of the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. Ms. Salas, thanks for joining us. It's, um, it's been a while, I guess, since we've seen you and in tough times now, but uh, we really appreciate it. How are you doing today? Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me again. Um, yes, I, you know, as probably feels like the same way to everyone. Every day feels like the same day. Uh, but we are really busy and my agency continuing to do provide all of our services from our, our office, from our agency uh, remotely to be able to serve consumers and workers. You know, this um, Metro Drugs, by the way, is only maybe five or six blocks from my apartment. And I had heard a little bit about this even before it made it into the news. But why don't you tell a little bit uh, about what transpired with um, uh, Metro um, drugs and the the masks. Why don't you let us know what happened there? Yeah, so I have to say that probably since the first week of March or last week of February, we began to see an increasing volume of calls and complaints about price gouging situations throughout New York City neighborhoods, right? Um, and we issued a couple of declarations that were targeting face masks and hand sanitizers because some of the businesses uh, in our neighborhoods were beginning to charge really, really outrageous prices for these items that um, our New York City residents find that they need. Um, and so in, uh, on about March 16th, we finally published a rule that makes a lot of products um, that New Yorkers right now um, are using to either prevent the spread of the, of the disease or to help with the treatment of the disease. It makes it illegal for businesses in New York City to overcharge consumers for these items. Now, yeah. What are those products specifically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we started with face masks, hand sanitizers, uh, disinfectant wipes, and now the rule has extended it to products like Tylenol, for instance, alcohol, um, and other, you know, just medications and other cleaning products that are recommended right now to maintain a, a very sanitized environment. So let's say, you know, I walked into a neighborhood pharmacy or someplace and I felt that I was being taken advantage of. Well, it's not like I could walk into the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Like, how do you, how do you get the word out? Yeah. So we continue to receive complaints as usual. If you call 311, which is the number that, you know, people in New York City should memorize for any services from the government, um, you will be rerouted to our uh, phone numbers. We have our staff working remotely, but taking the calls from 311 on their agency cell phones, on their emails, inboxes. Um, so you can call 311. On Twitter, if you follow the department, we also have received plenty of complaints through social media. Uh, but certainly, we've gotten over 5,000 complaints to date just since March 5th on price gouging, and we have issued over 2,000 violations already to businesses. So walk me through it. How does that work? Let's say you, you, know, you receive a complaint on the phone. Do you then walk into a Metro Drugs and then question them, look around, look at receipts? What does your um, department do? Yeah. yeah, exactly that, right? We have inspectors who are in the field uh, obviously maintaining good social distancing practices in the field, uh, but they need to be out there responding to the complaints from consumers and visiting specific businesses for which we have information that are overcharging consumers. So an example I can give you, when we first heard about the face masks, I, I already had some of my inspectors going out there in the field monitoring uh, price increases and shortages of these items. And I went to a Chinatown business where, that was selling face masks for close to $200 for 10 masks, which usually run for less than $10. So that is the kind of behavior we are targeting, right? The rule says that, you know, you're, you cannot increase prices more than 10% of what you were selling the items at before the COVID-19 situation occurred. 
Now, the prices are different depending on the stores, right? Walmart may sell at one price. The corner store may sell at a different price. So we're going to look at your specific uh, pricing scheme, right? We're going to ask for documentation on that. And you may have some justification for charging a higher price if your uh, supplier or the distributors are charging you more money. We take that into account. So I assume it's also very important if you're a consumer to at least keep your receipt or something that would be able to provide as proof once you prosecute the particular misconduct. Am I correct? Absolutely. Consumers should keep copies of the of the receipts. Um, and businesses, like I said, again, we don't do not want to get in the way of these essential businesses bringing these products to their um, consumers to their neighborhoods, right? If you're paying a higher price for, let's say, Lysol wipes than you used to pay before, that will, that will you know, merit a higher cost to the consumer and we'll take that into account. So we tell businesses who are trying to do the right thing, just keep records of all your expenses and we're going to look at that too. Hey, and what are the penalties, by the way? Let's say you, mm -hmm. you could be found guilty of doing this. What types of teeth do you do do you put in there to make sure that this doesn't happen again yes yeah, so uh, metro drugs is a good example of this where you know in some cases we go out to a business and they they realize that what they're doing is illegal and then ch they change their practices and that is what we want right but with metro drugs we went a couple of times and there were um price gouging consumers on face masks we issued violations. Um, each violation can run up to $500. We now filed a lawsuit in court just a few days ago against Metro Drugs, seeking almost $40,000 in penalties for continuing to violate our price gouging rules. Um, and we're hoping to make that um, them as an example. We are targeting other repeat persistent violators of this law, and uh, we may be announcing more of these cases later this week. Well, Commissioner, any final tips you would give our viewers uh, who are maybe watching today and believe that some local institution has been taking advantage of uh, them or their family? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I say, same as before, call 311. Uh, consumers should also make sure that they're following the official guidelines and, and advice from New York City and New York State and federal officials, right? Uh, for a long time, people were running out to buy face masks, and the advice was to, you know, that you didn't really need it unless you are sick, it, you could expose other people to that. So just listen for the uh, official guidance coming from your government officials before you rush and start buying products. And certainly you can tell the business if you believe they increase the prices that they need to correct that or you're call, going to call 311 and our office is going to investigate. All right, Lorelai Asalas, the commissioner of the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. Lorelai, as usual, thanks so much for being with us. And most importantly, please stay safe. Same to you. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. We'll be back with more today's verdict right after this. Joshua Goldstein of the Law Office of Joshua Goldstein is with us today. Uh, first of all, Josh, how are you doing? Staying safe? I'm doing all right. I've uh, I've managed to get out of New York City right now for the meantime. Well, that's good. You know, the, the New York City, I'm in the Upper East Side here. There's a lot of um, safe distancing. We're working on it. Uh, but, um, you know, the show has to go on. So we want to talk to you a little bit about estate planning, and it's a tough time to have to discuss this, but certain there are things that I think our viewers should know, um, especially during this time um, uh, in our uh, country. So um, are you getting a lot of calls from people in terms of uh, their own estate planning? Yes. I mean, as you can imagine, right now, this is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, people are concerned that if they go into the hospital, 
Uh, are their kids going to be taken care of? Uh, and do they have their other affairs in order if they don't come out of the hospital? So uh, definitely right now, this is a big opportunity for estate planning attorneys to uh, really educate the community on, on what they can do to be best prepared um, you know, in the event something unfortunate happens. So let's break it down, um, because sometimes people think, well, you know, estate planning uh, is only going to help um, my heirs if something happens to me, you know, which, of course, would make things easier. But of course, there are things that you can do to protect yourself right now in terms of decisions and things that have to be made for you if, God forbid, you end up in the hospital. Um, take it from that point. What should people be doing to protect themselves with respect to preparing for an unfortunate ending with respect to the virus? Sure, yes, so estate planning covers two categories. It covers incapacity and it covers death. And um, right now, you know, we need to make sure that people have addressed uh, elements around whether they become incapacitated. Have they appointed a standby guardian for their children in case both parents are not available to take care of the kids? And have they thought about who can be that standby guardian, which is an important thing. A lot of people have appointed guardians in their wills and those guardians are out of state. And you really need somebody uh, who's local, who if you have to go to the hospital, somebody you, who, who you can hand your kids over to, somebody who you know uh, understands um, the, the needs of your children. Just from like the, the standpoint of, let's say, the Article 81s and the mental hygiene law in New York, you have your personal need guardians and you have your property guardians. That's correct. You know, it, it, does that factor into this at all as well? Uh, not really under these circumstances. I mean, if somebody has a guardian uh, under an Article 81 guardian, then that's a separate issue. Uh, I'm really speaking more of guardians for your children. And uh, that's not going to be that's going to be a personal needs guardian, not a financial guardian. That is a person who can come in and take care of the personal needs of your children during some period while you're unavailable to parent. And this uh, this happens, you know, in the event that somebody were to go into the hospital. This happens sometimes when people get incarcerated and they need to make sure, uh, you know, that they've that they have somebody who can step in and uh, take responsibility for their kids at that at that moment. Uh, and Joshua, does this also take into account the healthcare proxies as well? In other words, individuals who'll be making some of your, you know, decisions for you, do not resuscitate orders, uh, feeding tube, that type of thing. Right. Thank you, David. That's a very important part of incapacity planning as well. Um, you would want to have a healthcare proxy, which is somebody uh, who understands your wishes and can be the person uh, who makes decisions in the event that you're not able to make healthcare decisions for yourself. And you ideally want to do something called a living will or advanced directive. And that's the kind of document that specifies, you know, what your stance is on intubation, uh, do not resuscitate orders. Now, I want to uh, be I want to be clear to your uh, audience that at the moment there's some things happening in in the New York hospitals where it's not clear whether uh, if you specify in your advanced directive that you would like to be maintained on, on artificial um, sustenance and artificial means whether the hospital can actually accommodate that need right now. Right, right, because there are only so many ventilators. So somebody might, you know, you might say, look, they may tell your family member, I know he wanted to stay alive for as long as possible, but there's really no, no bringing him back at this point. And there's somebody right next to him who is going to die if we don't get ventilated to them. I think that's really what we're talking about. Yes, and, that, and that's a very scary thing about what's happening right now. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, if you've done an advanced directive or a living will in the past, it's worth revisiting them because what I have found is that a lot of clients did not want uh, to be intubated. They, they have put in their uh, old advanced directives things like, I'm not interested in being sustained on uh, art, artificial uh, support, life support. And you might have changed your stance right now. That's right. Uh, if the, right, if because you know, well, right, you thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd be much older, you know, in my mid nineties. Don't intubate me. But hey, wait a second, I'm fifty five years old, and you might be able to keep me going, and then I can get out of the hospital in three weeks, hopefully, or six weeks. Right, it would be a total, total change. That's correct. Uh, let's talk a little bit about also how it affects your family relations 
once this is all over, I mean, God forbid you pass away. Well, you, you want your, your siblings, your, your, your children to get along. Isn't that also an important reason to really set up some type of estate planning? Well, and so that deals with the estate planning for death, right? And uh, it, yeah. yes, it is absolutely important to have specified you know, what you would, how you would like your assets to be addressed, uh, who you'd like to receive them. If there's a family heirloom, that's important. Um, but you know, these are, these are very complex, uh, and, and important decisions. And, uh, I guess one of the silver linings about this, this particular tragedy is that it's, it's creating an environment in which people are having a dialogue about some things that are generally pretty uncomfortable, uh, but that are very important to speak about with your family. So, uh, well, Joshua, let me ask you a question. Let's say somebody wants to reach you and somebody wants to talk about a living will, healthcare proxy, and, and start getting that done. How do you do it when you know it's hard to get a hold of a notary? You know, it's hard to be in the same room with someone to notarize your healthcare proxy, your living will, etc. Are there any exceptions that are being made at this point, or or do you know? Yes. So the good the good thing is is that the governor uh, issued an executive order which allows for notarization to take place over video conferencing. Uh, and so this is something that I have been doing with clients uh, to make sure that uh, if they have a trust that was created, um, that we can notarize things and, and make changes to them. Now, there is a little complexity because a lot of these documents also need to be witnessed. Uh, and, oh, they need, and they need to be witnessed by people who don't have an interest in them. So you can't have your standby guardian be the person who witnesses your standby guardian appointment. So what, what would you do? Find a neighbor down the street? I've heard some uh, pretty interesting stories about people meeting in parking lots and each person standing six feet away and then going up to the trunk of a car and signing documents. I mean, unfortunately, uh, while the, the, the electronic notarization uh, executive order has been very helpful, uh, we're still grappling, the, the entire trust and estates uh, uh, community is still grappling with how, with the best practice for uh, witnessing documents that, ha that require witnesses. Before we let, let, let you go, could you tell the viewers how somebody could reach you if they have a question or they want to just talk to you about something? Sure. Thank you, David. Um, you can reach me by email. I am at JJG, that's Joshua James Goldstein, JJG at privateclientlawoffice.com. My website is www.privateclientlawoffice.com. All right. Well, uh, Joshua, thank you. It's a, it's a trying time uh, for everybody. And, uh, you know, your advice is very, very important, very important during this particular time. But most important, you stay safe. Okay. You too, David. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, we'll be back with more today's verdict right after this. Well, that's all we have for tonight. I'd like to thank our three guests for joining us. And of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you have any questions, you could always email me at davidlesh at bronxit.org or tweet us at David Lesh. Uh, remember, from all of us at the staff, know your issues, reach a verdict. We'll see you next time.